Hi, welcome to Uncork Your Mind. In this episode, it's all about wine for Bet Street and the Katsafali grape. And we are joined by Evan Turner, who is the wine director and sommelier at Krasi Mezzi and Wines, which is a restaurant in Boston. And I believe he has the like second largest Greek wine list in the country. So please listen, uh, uncork your mind, and learn a little bit about some Greek wine. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to Uncork Your Mind, where we take the intimidation out of wine with your host, Debbie Giaquindo, the Hudson Valley wine goddess. We're live. Hello. Oh, hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to Wine for Bet Street. And I'm just going to say, I don't know if I was hallucinating it, audible hallucinating it or not, but I thought I heard some wine pouring while we were in that 15 second hall. Was I anticipating it or was somebody pouring wine? Mine's already poured. I'm, I'm poured. I was, oh, I, I just, I, I think I'm you're auditory hallucinating. hallucinating. I'm auditory I'm hallucinating. hallucinating. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, that's always a good thing to hear, you know. <laughs> so welcome to Wine for Bed Street. Today, we all have um, Evan Turner with us, who is a master sommelier and head of the wine. I'm going to let him say what his actual title is, but he is the man in the United States to go to to talk about Greek wine. And today we are talking about Costafali. Did I do it right? Very good. Very close. Very good. All right. Excellent. Very close. All right. So welcome to Wine for Bet Street. We, uh, in case you are new to here, my name is Lori, the co-host. I am a Spanish wine scholar, WSCT level two, Coteron specialist, champagne specialist, and owner of Dracina Wines in Paso Robles. And uh, just signed up to be a judge for a new competition. So I'm excited about that. But today I'm so excited to talk about this Greek wine. And my co-host, Debbie. I'm Debbie Giaquindo. I'm known as the Hudson Valley Wine Goddess. I'm a certified specialist of wine, a wine location specialist in port and champagne, and a certified sherry wine specialist. I am author of the book, uh, Tapping the Hudson Valley Day Trips and Weekend Itineraries to the Hudson Valley Wine Region. And I'm co I'm a partner in a restaurant in North Wildwood called Trio North Wildwood. And I think that's it for now. Um, I'm coming to you from Greenport, uh, New York. I'm out here on the North Fork of Long Island going wine tasting. So excuse the background. We have a bare bones hotel room. It's And it's a really nice hotel, this harbor front hotel, but there's like no desk or anything. So I'm sitting here in the bed <laughs> coming to you with my, my, my glass of Costa Fari. Is that right? Oh, no, <laughs> it's a so and we have with us Evan Turner and uh, Evan, please uh, introduce yourself and give us all your accolades. Sure. Sure. My name is Evan Turner. I'm a certified sommelier through the court of master sommelier. So I'm not a master of some. Oh, sorry. Sorry. I don't want to, don't want to take a title. I don't, I don't rightfully have, um, but I am the wine director for the Cinea Greek hospitality group up here in, uh, uh, in Boston. I work as the wine director for Krasi restaurant, for the new restaurant that we just opened, Bar Vlaha, and I also do the wine direction for their other restaurant uh, committee. Um, I've been working with Greek wine for years and years and years. The, the main reason I have a passion for wine is because of my time living in Greece as a kid. I'm not actually Greek. I always like to point that out, but I had the lovely pleasure of living there for a number of years as a, as a young teen um, and fell in love with the place. And when I became a sommelier, Greek wine was always on my mind and became sort of my main area of, of expertise about 10, 10 years ago or so now. And I've been working with it exclusively for about the last seven or eight years. Wow. That is, that is impressive. That is impressive. So as is normal, before we get to clinking virtually, we have Elmo to come visit us. That's so right. let's get started.
Oh, I love that at the end. Yeah. Lori, unmute yourself. Oh, okay. I uh, love that at the end. That was priceless. <laughs> so for those who are just going to listen to this as a podcast, you missed what is by far my favorite picture ever of a wine professional, non-wine professional, <laughs> anything. I absolutely love that photo. It um, So if you are only listening on the podcast, you need to jump over to YouTube um, and check out the video, at least just to the very beginning so you can see that image. So Evan, welcome so much. Thank you for coming on. Of and um, it is finally time to raise a glass. And I say slancha, but how would you say cheers in Greek? Yamas. 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 Interesting. So it is an oxidative wine. Yes, okay. definitely. Yes. This particular one is for sure. It's also got seven years of bottle age too. So it's also <laughs> seven years old. So that's also something that's that's factoring into the flavor profile of the wine as well. Um, oh. But I think you're fi I'm also finding that it's got a fair amount of alcohol and some, and some definite um, heft to the wine, even though it's rather light in color and and not too heavy necessarily but there's definitely some body weight i would find to the wine interesting yeah. yeah um so we'll we'll dive into that a little bit more depth into the actual tasting notes and everything as we get going but uh we want to get into knowing a little bit more about you evan and um how you're how your yeah, path you're is. responsible for the largest greek wine list Second largest. It's it's second largest. So second it's second largest. largest. Vine pear lied. Vine pear lied. Well, see, for the longest time, it was the largest. While there was a restaurant that was oh, there was a there's a rest a lovely restaurant in New York called Molivos, um, in New York City that I recommend anyone go to, that had the long largest Greek wine list in the country for a long time. They closed, and while they were closed. We moved into first place, but they've since reopened, and I believe their list has now passed ours. I'm not positive about this, but I, all I know is that we have over 350 different Greek wine selections. It's wow. a massive list. There's a lot to drink there, including this wine, which I think is absolutely delicious. Um, so there's plenty of stuff to have if you come down to Crossy and uh, enjoy our wine list. I'm going to be bringing my husband in when we go to visit our daughter. Please, please Greek. do. Please so. do. He you would know. absolutely adore it. But um, why Greek wine? I mean, you, you off before we started the show, you were telling us a little bit that you lived in in Greece mm. for a lot, you know, a long time, you know, as a kid and everything. So, is that where your infatuation began? Yes. And you I, wanted to share. I mean, it? I, I, mean, I, I moved, <clears throat> I moved to Greece when I was eleven, and had you know this long, 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 long flight. I got off the plane. Uh, my stepfather was an English teacher. He taught English as a second language. That was his, his profession as an English professor of a second language. And I arrive in Greece on a hot August day after flying all the way from Charlotte, North Carolina, where I was staying with family in North Carolina. And at 11 years old, my parents say to me, don't get comfortable. Get get yourself cleaned up. We're going out to dinner with all the new teachers, which when you're 11 years old, it translates into, I'm going to go eat with old people, right? And I don't, <laughs> want to, and I don't want to do that. When you're 11, you don't want to eat with old people. And we go to this taverna on the outskirts of Thessaloniki, and we sit down. And from the very moment I started eating, I fell in love with Greece. I can still tell you, who sat to my left, who sat to my right, the very first thing I ate, all the other dishes that I ate that night, I was 11. I turned 53 wow. in March. So that was a long time ago and I still remember it. And from there, that love of Greek cuisine then translated as I got older around 16, 17, the very first winery I ever visited was in Greece, falling in love with Greek wine and seeing that there was something more there than just scary old Retsina. And then as I became a sommelier, I always kept Greek wines, even in a small way, on my wine lists, and then decided after I had become a certified sommelier back in about 2008 or 2009, um, 
I said, you know, there are lots of Psalms that are experts about California, and there are lots of Psalms who are experts about Bordeaux or Burgundy or Tuscany or Spain or so on and so forth. And that's wonderful, and it's amazing, and we need those people. But there aren't enough people who are out there advocating and promoting the beautiful wines from Greece. And there was so much happening in Greece at the time. You know, really this heyday was starting to really build and I said, this is what I want to do with my career. This is what I really want to do is I want to have the chance to sell Greek wine to people, to show people how beautiful the wines are, and in some small way, give back to them. Because at the end of the day, I'm who I am, and I'm a much better person for it, for having lived in Greece. And I almost feel like I owe it to them to sort of show off their great wines because there's really nothing else I can do except talk about wine. <laughs> <laughs> now, were, were you in Athens or were you in Crete? When I was in, I was in Thessaloniki. So it's the okay. second uh -huh. largest city and that's yep. up in the North. Yeah. The Northern yep. part of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you, you had a restaurant in Houston, the Helen Greek food and wine, and that was a James Beard finalist. So first of all, congratulations. Like we were that... James, again, somebody, we were James Beard semifinalist. Oh, I am. You know what? I am. I am booting out Vine Pair. I am not using <laughs> no, them as a reference ever again. <laughs> okay, so no, we were a semifinalist for best new restaurant. Yeah, it was. It was a great, great, and we had a lot of great accolades. The restaurant's still open down there. Um, I just an absolutely wonderful, wonderful place in every way, shape, and form. And it was a very, very exciting to sort of show Houston everything there was, was to show about Greek wine. But when the opportunity came to move back up to the Northeast, where I'm sort of quasi originally from, um, and the chance to work with Dimitri Tsolakis, who is the head of the Sydney restaurant group, I just, I couldn't turn down this opportunity. So I, I had to do it. So how were you, how were you in Houston? Is that just where you came back to, or did you go to Houston to start that restaurant? No, no, no. I had, I had moved down there uh, to with my with my family with my oh, okay. with my wife with my wife and and our first child. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that must be like even like like even just to be on that list of James Beard, that must be like it an was, incredible like pat you know, yourself on the back, right? It was amazing. I, look, that was amazing. The accolades that we received from the local media and the statewide media in Texas were incredible. Our first couple of years being open. Shoot, we, Eater National, when they gave out their national awards, gave us best wine program in 2016. That was absolutely huge. I, I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Um, yeah, no, it's, it, but it's been about the wine. You know, I mean, that's the thing is that the wines are so good. And I think that people are coming to Greek wine and discovering, holy smokes, it's not your Papu's Retsina. You know, <laughs> it's not it's not your grandparents Retsina anymore. And there's a lot of great wine to be had. And when people discover that, it really excites people. It really excites them a lot. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about Greece um, before getting into Costafali. Um, I've been to Greece once. Um, I've been to Athens. I've been to um, uh, Santorini, and I've been to Hios. Um, but what's the climate like, and and the whole culture um, from your perspective? Mm. Well, I think it, it's very, very climate wise. It's incredibly varied. You know, you can go to Santorini, which is arid. I actually qualifies as desert climate. Mm -hmm. You can go to the vineyards right outside of Athens, and that's classically Mediterranean. You can go to the vineyards in the Peloponnesos, which is Mediterranean, mitigated by high mountain vineyards that are up at two and a half, three thousand feet. You can go to northern Greece, which is continental climate, and the weather's a lot like New England, and they have ski resorts close by, and you would oh, never wow. think you would never think you were in Greece. For a moment, if you walked around and they took down all the street signs and no one said anything in Greek for a half an hour, you might think you're somewhere in the lower Alps. Totally different. It's that diversity that's really exciting about Greece and where you're really getting all these really in interesting wines. Crete, for example, is basically shaped like a giant Toblerone bar. Yes, <laughs> I love Toblerone. It's, a, it's just a big wedge right in the Mediterranean. And these vineyards are planted at higher altitudes, 
to get mitigation from what are the warm winds coming through the through the Aegean to let these wines have a lot more cool climate qualities to them, even though they're somewhere warm like Crete. Um, there's just a lot of diversity in Greece, a lot of diversity. It just depends on where you're at. There's a lot more to Greece than meets the eye because I think people go just in the summertime. They go to very specific places that are absolutely beautiful and, and spectacular, but have very sort of classic Mediterranean climate. Meanwhile, in other parts of the country where they're doing a lot of a great growing for wine, the weather's quite different. So what's the weather like in Crete? Um, it depends greatly. What I would say is that it's Mediterranean mitigated by high altitude vineyards. So, for example, with this particular wine, this is at about 1,000 feet, 750 to 1,000 feet up. So what ends up happening there is a lot like this. You have this wonderful wind that's blowing from north to south towards the island of Crete. And so you get Mediterranean mitigated by winds that keep things cool, keep the nights much cooler and much drier during the summertime so you're not getting any mildew or rot. And then when you're up at these higher altitudes, if you're in the shade, it actually gets quite cool. And certainly at night, it gets very, very windy and very cool. And so during the daytime, it can be in the 80s or the high 80s, below 90s. And then at the night, it can easily get into the 50s where you have to, you know, put a coat on or put a pair of pants back on after you're wearing shorts all day because it's basically Mediterranean climate mitigated by winds and altitude. So it gets quite cool and it's, it's quite surprising. You can actually be in Crete in May, June, and even July sometimes and be standing in the water on the beach and look up at the mountain peaks across the ridge of Crete and they're still snow capped. Wow. Wow. That's pretty cool. It snowed there. <laughs> so it's, 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 it, it, there's a lot there's a lot to it. This particular wine comes from Central Crete, where, again, it's very mountainous. And really, again, these winds and these mountain peaks really mitigate the temperatures. And so if somebody wanted to go to Crete, how, how do they get there? What's the best way to get there? And is there anything that we should know before we go? Well, First of all, you should absolutely go because it's absolutely gorgeous. The food there is incredible. The hospitality is amazing. And Crete is really easy to get to. You usually would fly to Athens, and then from Athens, you can easily take a very quick plane ride from Athens to Crete. Um, you can also take the ferry if you want to take a, a longer, more sort of scenic uh, trip. Um, and there are plenty of wineries across Crete. There are plenty of wineries that are happy to see people. Um, especially in the western side of Crete, around Hanya. There are tons and tons of wineries to go visit, and there are lots of ways to go about doing that. It's a lot of fun and absolutely a blast to do so. Look, how, large, how large is the island? It's the fifth largest island in the Mediterranean. It's the largest Greek island. Um, it The roads aren't all that fantastic, so it takes a little while to drive from one end to the other, but it'd probably take you about two to three hours to drive from one end to the other of Crete. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not massive, but it's also not small. Okay. And right. is there anything that they should know, like, before we go, like, like what, <clears throat> if you're talking about these, the climate or, you know, the temperature changes and stuff, so they, you need to pack kind of warm, but then. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I found when I've been there in the summertime, I mean, I've been there in the spring, I've been there in the summertime. And in the spring, you definitely, it's, it's, it's windy, it's chilly. Um, there's still snow on the mountaintops, that type of thing. It, it can actually get quite cold. Um, and so you'd have to dress accordingly to, to cold weather climbs, you know, sweatshirts, sweaters, pants, so on and so forth. In the summertime, it's much more shorts during the day than throw on some pants or, uh, you know, a, a light jacket or something like that at the night in the nighttime will definitely make it a lot more comfortable for you. Um, but I would, I, it's, it's an amazing place. I haven't been nearly as much as I would love to go. I've been two or three times now. I'm, I'm eager to go back, uh, and see even more of the wineries because there are a bunch of them there. And what's exciting about Crete is that they're not only growing some of the Greek varieties that you find in other parts of Greece and international varieties that you also find like Syrah and Roussan and Marsan and Grenache mm. and, and others, um, they also grow a lot of ind indigenous cultivars as well that are grown only on Crete. And so there's just a plethora of diversity when it comes to what you can go there and taste through and try at all these different wineries. It's a real adventure. Wow. It's a, it sounds like 
the whole climate, the, when I was at, um, in Hios and Santorini, we didn't need a jacket. I think it was July. Yeah, we it's, it stays it stays a lot warmer there yeah. by and large. I mean, yeah. Santorini can get pretty windy, but it stays pretty warm the whole time. But yeah. when you're up, when you're in the vineyards, which are up in the mountains in Crete, it gets it gets cold. To give yeah. you an example of this, I I was in the mountains of Crete at a winery, and then we'd been walking around in the vineyard itself, which was very very warm. And then they had set up uh, some things for us to eat and drink and so on and so forth. And they had placed it under this large fig tree. And you know how figs get gigantic leaves when they get big and older, mm-hmm. you know, big old fig trees. And I stepped under the canopy of all these leaves to get a glass of water or you know, a bite to eat. And it was as if I stepped into a refrigerated room. <laughs> oh, wow. Because the wind was blowing down from the Aegean, sort of up the mountainside. And I, and I, and I literally did the whole sort of stepped outside back into the sun and went, it's hot. Step back inside <laughs> and it's cool. Step back outside and it's hot. Step wow. back so it really, it definitely... You definitely feel it for sure. And if you're there during the spring or later fall, it definitely starts to get, it gets cooler. I mean, it wow. still stays warm. Let's not, I mean, it, it doesn't turn into Vermont. Let's not make, <laughs> let's, not, let's not get crazy now, but it definitely is. If you're up in the mountains where the vineyards are, make sure you bring a light jacket along for the winter, for the, for the, not winter, for the nighttime. Okay. Yeah. So, can you explain the origin and the history of the Castafali grape and how it became indigenous to the island of Crete? A little bit. There's a lot of this that still is unknown, frankly. But okay. Castafali is only grown on the island of Crete. It's grown nowhere else. They've not. They might. They may have test plantings of it in other parts of Greece through universities or that type of thing. But it is an indigenous cultivar to the island. Um, that's been there for at least a few centuries that they know of. Um, As to whether it was brought there at any time prior to that, there isn't any concrete information to that. Chances are it's been on the island of Crete for thousands and thousands of years, along with some of the other main red grapes like Liatico and Mandalari or Mandalaria, as it's also sometimes called. But what's interesting about Cozzefali is that unlike the one we're tasting tonight, it frequently gets blended with other grapes as well. And so it's always been a blending grape. So to sort of see it on its own like this is, is rather unique. But in terms of its actual origin story, a lot of that information is still being sussed out because um, that there just hasn't been the finances and the resources mm-hmm. in Greece to do that kind of long-term DNA work, which is very expensive to do. So most evidence is, it's indigenous to the island. It's not grown anywhere else in the Mediterranean. Nowhere else has it in any way, shape, or form. So it's most likely indigenous, and it's likely centuries and centuries old. And so they do not know at this point who the parents are. No, they don't. There, it doesn't have it doesn't have any close relatives. <laughs> not, in, in all the in all the research that I've done, um, even doing a little bit of sort of brush up homework, you know, lately. Um, there's no, it's not like, it's not like Cabernet Sauvignon parents are, are Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And everybody knows that, or that Chardonnay, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Noir are all very closely related. These ancient Greek grapes are so old that in many cases they're on their own now and they don't know where they came from originally because they could have been, I mean, they're sort of saying it's indigenous to the, to the Island of Crete, but it could have been brought by the Assyrians and, two, three, mm-hmm. four thousand years ago, potentially, or bought from the Greeks from the mainland and it died out somewhere else and now just stays in, on Crete. But what they do know is that it's not grown anywhere else. It's only grown on Crete. And nowadays in the modern era, it tends to get blended with things rather than made into wine on its own. Those are the things that they do know for a fact. So what makes Crete so, <clears throat> you know, the marriage to the, you know, between the grape and the island you know, the soil conditions, the climate. I mean, what makes the grape just thrive in Crete and not grown anywhere else? Well, I think that it's, it's something we were, it actually gets to, to something that we were talking about before we went on mm-hmm. um, when I mentioned that um, it's important to realize when you're talking about the Greek wine industry that 80% of Greek wineries are 20 years old or younger. 
you know, as I was saying earlier, if you're of legal drinking age, if you've just turned 21 in this country, making you, you go out and buy a drink for the first time legally, you're older than 80% of the Greek wine industry. So for most, um, for most of this industry, there hasn't been a lot of experimentation yet. They're still getting their feet under them in a lot of ways. Miranakis is really interesting in that they were around since 1966, this particular winery, um, which makes them ancient by Greek wine standards. Them making this wine as a single vineyard monovarietal style is also rather unique. So you really don't see much experimentation in terms of, you know, oh, let's move this grape around just yet. They're still sort of finding their, their footing when it comes to the wine itself on the island of Crete. But one of the things that makes Crete so exciting for these wines to be made is this wonderful combination of perfect climate, Wonderful combination of clay and alluvial soils, along with a little bit of sand that makes the growing conditions really fantastic, where you're getting good ripeness, where you're getting nice fruit and richness on the fruit side, and still good tannic structure or acid on the acid and, and, and the back end from, you know, just that nice balance. And you're finding that time and time again with these wines. They tend to be, tend to be, you know, a little lower in alcohol. Uh, they don't tend to put them in oak as long. This wine only sees time in old French oak barrels. It doesn't see any new oak. Um, and it's more of those sort of subtleties that they're looking for in these gr Greek wines rather than bigger, bolder flavors, which I think are really kind of exciting and a definite difference compared to a lot of other places around the globe right now making wine. And so in in the terroir, what you were just talking about, that, you know, the clay and the sand and all of that, how do you think that impacts the flavor of the wine. So what would be, so this is a 100%, which you said is kind of a rarity. It's, mm -hmm. it's more often blended, but what would you say to the listeners or viewers as to what would be, if I'm picking up a bottle of, you know, if I'm picking a bottle up, what can I expect in there? Oh goodness. That's a great question. Um, well, a couple of things. I think that you're looking for, a good way to describe Kotsafali when it's on its own is a fist in a velvet glove. There's a lot of power and intention there, but it also has subtlety and finesse and elegance. Um, I like to compare Kotsafali to things like Grenache, um, okay. to lighter styles of the lighter styles of Grenache, not the really big higher alcohol styles, but some of the lighter styles of Grenache, lighter styles of Rhone Valley wines. Um, you're seeing that as well in that terms of style. And I think when we taste this, that's what it reminds me of, at least personally, is that sort of style of wine. Um, the other thing that's important, I think, to, to realize about Kotsafali is that wonderful, long, dry, darn near arid growing season makes the grapes really stress. And so what little fruit is produced really gets great concentration of flavor. Um, and that's coming from basically, you know, they very little, if any, irrigation. They're letting those vines really work hard. Um, and so you're getting, you know, great concentration of fruit flavors as well. How many acres um, are currently cultivated? Do you know? Of Kotsafali? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, in this particular one, this is tiny. They, they I mean, their entire operation all of Lidarakis is is their entire thing is about 25 acres total <laughs> they, they have very but, very i mean total. well within within creed how many um acres of that I, that I honestly that i honestly don't know to give you an, a, 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 a off the top of my head could answer. you could you correlate it to in terms of maybe not actual acreage but in terms of relativity like how much costa Feli is grown in relation to other is it one of the more it's not. It's not. Okay. It's 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 in terms of the amount of Kotsafali actually grown in in, in Greece. Period. Uh, it's about three percent of all. Oh, of all. okay. It's oh, wow. Small. And I mean, here's the thing too. Greece is still. I mean, Greece is the size of Louisiana in terms of square mileage, almost exactly the same size. So it's not a big place, and their entire cultivation of grapes and wine made yearly is less than Bordeaux. So Bordeaux alone makes more wine than all of Greece does, wow. to give you an idea. It's not a lot. 
it's growing and it's growing fast, but it's still smaller than even what Bordeaux does. And it's in a, in a, in a, in a nation that's the size of Louisiana. So it's not a big place by any stretch of the imagination. And, wow. and there's not a lot. And like I said, Cote Safali is only about three, three percent of all of all grapes planted. It's about about that that much. The thing that's also important to realize about Greece is that there aren't any really, really dominant cultivars in terms of, oh, it's 60 percent or 20, you know, 25 percent. There are over 300 indigenous grapes in Greece. And so there's so much planted mm. all over the place that you're getting little dribs and drabs at every little nook and cranny of, of every island, every bit of the mainland um, that leaves no real grape as the dominant grape. For example, Savatiano is a white grape, and it's the most widely planted grape, mostly planted on the mainland. Um, and it's about 16% of everything planted, only 16%. But it's number one at 16%, just wow. to give you an idea. So it's... This, these kind of figures are a little a little hard to get, get a representation of what Greece is doing because again it's also young it's also very very new and I'm sorry that just blows my mind when you think about how wine history has been intertwined with Greek you know it, it yeah it blows my mind that the hit that it's not more developed you know or older there where it is but. right well, I mean, they had four year, 400 years of Ottoman occupation and the Ottomans didn't take winemaking too yeah. kindly. <laughs> and so while the rest of Europe was really creating their wine ethos, their wine culture, Greece was doing that. And then, you know, that went that went on from the 1400s to the 1800s. Then the Greeks had a nearly century long revolutionary war to move the Ottoman Turks out of Greece. That all ended around World War I. Then there was a lot of strife in the country. Then there was World War II. Then there was a civil war. Then, there, I mean, there's just been a lot. Greece has gone through a lot. And so it's only been in the recent past where they could really get going when it comes to, to winemaking. Let, let's, let's see what happens in the next. I mean, things have been pretty exciting in the last five to seven years. Let's see what happens in another five years or another 10 years. And then we'll really be, I think we'll see Greece really got its feet under it and really making strides. Fantastic. Yeah. And really emerge as a, as a wine destination. Region. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, cause even, even enotourism in Greece is not really as big as it could be. It's only now kind of growing. It's just not the same thing. Um, People go to Greece and they, they go to Athens and then they go to the islands. And of course they should, because yeah. it's absolutely fabulous. Why wouldn't you do that? Mm -hmm. But to sort of go to Greece and say, oh, I'm going to go to the mountains of Northern Greece and go visit wineries. That's not what somebody thinks to do. It's just, it's very new. No, you're yeah. absolutely right. I mean, when I went, we went, you know, to Santorini, to the beach and. Yeah. Because you know, why wouldn't you? I mean, it's so beautiful. Thing. Yeah. And we went toward the Acropolis at hundred degrees. Never again. <laughs> it was <so> crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Only the dumb American tourists would do that. <laughs> Athens, Athens, who is with the Greek? Athens, so. in, Athens in the summertime is brutal. Is oh, brutal. it is. It is. So, in the vineyard, is uh, Castafali like relatively disease resistant? Is it you know? Does it have problems in the vineyard that the vineyard not managers need to pay no. attention? It, it 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 does not. And the nice thing about the nice thing about Crete in general is that because it stays arid and windy, they don't really have pro yeah. they don't really have problems. You know what the biggest problem they have in Crete for the vineyards? Fire, yeah. fire, wow. wildfires. Just, wow. just right. they, yeah, I mean, just this last summer they lost a number of really old vineyards to to wildfires. I mean, they have lots of wildfires in, in Greece all the time during the summertime, mm -hmm. but that's one of the major, that's one of the major issues that they come across is wildfires. But in terms of rot, mildew, you know, fungus, pests, not really a problem, not really a problem. So, you know, it's well-drained soil, mostly white and red clay, um, a little calcareous as well. Um, and, the, the weather tends to stay very consistent throughout the growing season. Um, 
And so the only thing that they really worry about the, the big thing to, to one of the big stresses on vineyards is, is heat. And then, and then wildfire. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't have ever, I would have never thought. Yeah, I didn't, I've never put that I didn't together. Realize it was so dry. Yeah. yeah, it can get, it gets, I mean, it gets very breezy and very dry. Yes. Wow. So let's dive into the wine. Yeah. Sure. Um, so tell us about the producer and on the label, it states Maravois. I probably didn't pronounce that either. Um, well, style Mar wine. What does that mean? Oh, Maravois style wine. It's just an old style of making the wine in old oak barrels um, very, very naturally, effectively. Um, and this is, a, a, you know, a single vineyard. Uh, Canari is the name of the vineyard. It's about at 700 50 to a thousand feet up on the uh, slopes of uh, central central Crete. Um, and Maravoas is, is simply a, a sort of a, a style of making wine in old oak barrels. Okay. And these, these are, these are barrels. This wine gets aged in old French oak barrels for two and a half years. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Cause it, the label it? does say influence of oxygen. So, um, is that just their process or is that the typical? Like, can we find um, Katsafali in this is, this is styles? More, this is more Liranakis is doing it in a very traditional style. This is Liranakis okay. doing it traditionally. More often than not, if you're going to find Katsafali nowadays, if you go into your local wine shop and find Katsafali, you're more often than not going to find Katsafali blended with other Greek grapes or non-Greek grapes. Um, one of the big ones you see is Kotsafali blended with Syrah. That's what I and, tasted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the and then you also and then you also see Kotsafali blended with Liatico, which is a indigenous grape to the island of Crete, or Mandalaria, which is also another indigenous grape to. Well, they are pretty sure it's from Crete. This one so gets a little debate because it. The reason why they blend it, what are they trying to achieve with the blending? Like you said, this is. You know, it, it's it's rare that we we get to have just the grape itself, right? And so more more likely, you're going to find a blended grape. What does the blending bring to the wine? Well, in the case of Syrah, you're getting a lot more lush, dark fruit and spice and earth notes. Uh, with Mandalaria, it's getting a much more sort of crunchy berry kind of note to the wine, and with Liatico. That's more just out of tradition because the two were always blended together. Um, Kotsufali and Liatico being blended together is much more of a just traditional old school Greek thing to do. And you see some old school producers still do that to this day. And I, because I, I, I was at this Wines of Crete tasting last week, I'd say the Syrah brings a uh, color to it. Yes. And gives color. That's very yeah. good. Point. Yes. Yes. This is not, this is by all accounts, a very lightly colored wine. Yes. Yeah, I mean it's it yes. it basically looks like slightly amped up rosé, <laughs> to be right. quite honest. But yeah. it's unfined and unfiltered. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a vegan wine. It's totally natural. Um, Liranakis is an organic winery. Like I said, they've been around since 1966, which is you know, and they, and they're definitely very traditional. They have ten wines. Liranakis does that are their single vineyard varietal wines, and this is one of them, the Canari Cozzafali. And it's a female winemaker. It is a female winemaker as awesome. well. That is right. The head winemaker at, at, at uh, Kotsufali is, is a woman. That is correct. Is that a um, is that uncommon there? It is and uncommon, but changing very, very, very quickly. The number of women who are coming up as winemakers in, in Greece is at an a unbelievably wonderfully fast pace. It's very, very impressive how many female winemakers, assistant winemakers now becoming head winemakers are going on. A lot of the old, you know, the old, the old school guys are all retiring and giving things up. It's usually their daughters and granddaughters and other women who are taking over these really wonderful positions and making some amazing wines. Wow. That's, that's great. Yeah. yeah it's now, very, very cool. In, in the, in the vineyard, do you know what they look for when they it's time to harvest? Like, is this typically an early ripener or, you know, when are fairly, they? Fairly, fairly early. It usually happens sometimes into, depending on how the heat has been, late August into early September. 
is when they're okay. when they're harvesting. Um, any longer than that, you're, you're really getting into late harvest stuff, and it, and and the rains start coming in October as oh. well. You have to watch out for that as well. So okay. it's it's usually late. It gets hot enough that late August into September is when they do the harvesting typically, and where where you get phenolic ripeness. Now this wine is a 2017, so it is a, it is an aged wine. Mm -hmm. Is that the typical for the Castafali grape? Like grape. This is again. This is again. Lidarakis being very traditional and releasing the wine later. Oh, okay. So is this their current vintage? Um, I at least this is the current release that I'm able to get a hold of. Wow. So here I believe that it is. They, wow. You see that a lot in Greece, though, where they where they hold back red wines until they feel that they're ready to be released, and then release them. You know, when they feel that they're properly ready to drink. So this is six years old. So what does a young one taste like? Well, the young ones that I've ever had have all been blended. I've never had a young 100% Cozzafalli. This is the one 100% Cozzafalli I've ever had on its own. The young ones I have are much more vivacious and fruity and sometimes even mm -hmm. jammy, but they're also blended with other grapes. Right. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a, a, a fair assessment in, in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. It's not apples to apples. No, it certainly yeah. is not. It's not. Again, crazy, it's crazy. not common to see Cozzafalli on its own. I mean, you, you can go looking far and wide and they just don't, they blend it with other grapes. That's just tradition. So we are very lucky then. Yes. We're on. Yeah, this is sort of fun. I thought it would be, well, since you asked, you know, let's talk about Cozzafalli, let's, let's try it on its own, you know, and yeah. see what it's like yeah. you know, by itself, so to speak. Because the wine I tasted last week was blended with Syrah and it was, you know, definitely more intensive color and it had more body. And mm -hmm. I don't know what the year was. I don't really know much about it because it was a blind. Everything was a bad. Blind tasting, yeah, right. they wouldn't tell us anything. Well, that's a that's a disappointment that they wouldn't let you know. Very disappointment, disappointing. I mean, because I know. I mean, I wouldn't want to take a guess as because there are a number of different ones that blend. But the one that I know that's a Cozzafalli and Syrah that's fairly common is a wonderful winery named Alexakis. But I wouldn't want to hazard a guess. I couldn't. Yeah. I couldn't even tell you. Yeah, they only exactly. had one because a lot of their wines were still hung up in customs. Oh, um, really? Oh, that's yeah. disappointing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is is the um? How do you say the winery name? Uh, Lirarakis. 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 Yeah. Are they um? Are they like in the forefront for the promotion of Castafali? Is this they're, like... they're in the forefront of, of, of Cretan wineries, period. Oh, okay. They, they have been around for an age in, in the scheme of things since 1966. And so they do a lot of practice with things that are very traditional. And then they also have more modern takes on their wines as well. So they, they sort of really picking apart what's happening wine wise on the island of Crete is really what Lidarakis is all is all about. And they are highly regarded in terms of their reputation as, as a great winery that make whether it's simple table wine or more sophisticated wines like this, they're they're definitely considered at the apex of their of, of the game when it comes to Crete for sure. Wow. It's very cool. So this wine itself was actually grown in the Carnari area. Carnari so, is the name of the vineyard. Oh, that's the name of the vineyard. It's okay, the name so of the that's vineyard, the name of the vineyard. And it's from central. And it's from central Crete. And so, of all of Crete, is like you were talking about where the vineyards lie. If if somebody wanted to go wine tasting in Crete, is it? Like, are the wineries close to each other? Or Relatively they... close. What I would re what I would recommend if you were if you were to go if you were to go to Crete, I would recommend going to Western Crete and going in and around the area of Hanya. And Hanya, spelled in English, is C H A N I A Hanya, but it's pronounced H Hanya. And it's a beautiful area. There are lots and lots of wineries. There's actually a wonderful, I'm going, to, I'm going to give a plug to someone who won't even know that I'm giving this plug to them. There's a wonderful Greek-American husband and wife team called Hanya Wine Tours, and they actually give wine tours in and around Hanya. Um, and it's absolutely fantastic to go and do that. The Hanya Wine Tours, you can find them on Instagram. Oh, we'll um, see when we when we do this, we'll, we'll tag them. 
Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, so they're they're absolutely fabulous, and it's a great way to go. Hanya is easiest. It's easy to get around. You're right around the main areas of Iraq, Leon, and and that area. Um, it's 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 the most simple way to go visit Crete and go see wineries for sure. But you're going to definitely be going up in the hillsides. That's 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 for that's. that's so bring a jacket. So bring a jacket, as I've said a million times. Bring a jacket. Yes, exactly. So now let's start talking about what do we pair this with? I mean. You know, I mean, Greek food, non-Greek food. I mean, I, I I loved the food when I was over there. The food, look, the food oh. in Crete is, look, there's, there is a, a, there is a debate in Greece about where the best food in Greece is located. And it, it comes down to one of two places, either Thessaloniki or Crete. And even Athenians who are, you know, think that the world revolves around them, even Athenians will, will admit that the best two places to eat <laughs> in Greece are on Crete or up in Thessaloniki. Um, for two I had some good food in Santorini. The great food in Santorini, for yeah. sure. Absolutely. Um, but I would say that certainly with all kinds of Greek food, I also think this goes really well to sort of take it away from just doing Greek wine with Greek food, which is always great and fun to do. And we could certainly knock out a number of dishes. I could see this with, for example, really smoky grilled octopus being absolutely fantastic. Okay. Um, you know, that type of thing, uh, or obviously something like, uh, you know, a nice, any, anything you're growing over a charcoal flame in this, I think would be delicious. I also think this would go really, really well with some spicier dishes. I'd love to pair this with curry, for example. Okay. You know, I think that that would be an interesting, an interesting, you know, like a korma, or even a, a vindaloo or something like that. I think this would work really well with some of those you know, beef or lamb curries that you would get sort of as a, as a total change up from what you would traditionally do. But in terms of Greek stuff, any of your wonderful braised meat dishes, you know, uvetsi, um, cooking isto, um, anything over a charcoal flame where you're grilling lamb chops or whole lamb leg or that type of thing. And this wine would be absolutely delicious. I think it'd be fantastic to pair at the restaurant. Um, I pair this a lot with uh, the Uvetsi that we serve with the octopus that we currently have on the menu, which is a little bit more rustic with that's made with kale and black eyed peas and is a more of a braised style of, uh, of, um, of octopus. It goes really well with this. Um, this is also a great, great, it's hot. You don't feel like cooking. You don't feel like going out and grilling, but you want to buy charcuterie and cheese. It's a mm -hmm. great charcuterie okay. and cheese wine. It's a great charcuterie and cheese wine. And regardless of what kind of cheeses or charcuterie you buy, it really does well with that. Um, it's, it's a stunning wine. With you think that. it will go well with moustaka? Yes, I absolutely do. Yes, I, absolutely I think so too. Do. Yeah. As a classic, yeah, or pastizio, yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely, yeah, it would be fantastic. Um, whether and whether you did a moussaka that's a more vegetarian version or one with ground beef, either way, I think it would be fantastic, yes. Okay, so the non foodie here, non foodie and vegetarian, what is moussaka? We musaka? have a mus sorry, go ahead. No, we have a moussaka at our a dish on our menu at the restaurant, it's it's like a um, a lasagna. A Greek lasagna. It's eggplant, potatoes. Ours has um, oh, okay. gra ground uh, beef and ground lamb in it, and topped with bechamel. Yeah, ah. but you could make the, but yeah. you could make it, but you can make it vegetarian where you make it with just um, usually eggplant, potatoes. Sometimes they'll put in artichoke hearts as well for more Ooh. filler, and yeah. then usually with the bechamel and make it as a. Uh, and make it as a, a vegetarian ver version. There's actually lots of vegetarian dishes in Greek cuisine, lots of vegetable dishes. So there are plenty of things that you could do on the vegetable front. This would be, I think, great with something like a bowl of gigantes beans, which you take the big white elephant beans and you cook them for hours and hours and hours in a nice rich tomato sauce, crumble some feta cheese over the top of that and just eat a nice big bowl of beans and a nice glass of kotsafali. It'd be rustic. It'd be very country. It'd be very mm. homey and very sort of classic old school Greek to do something like that. I'm just going to say that you might have just described the first time ever on a wine for street. I started drooling when we talked about food. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That sounds right now. 
That's Shara here, delicious. my my travel companion, said she wants to be there right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I mean, oh, that's I so look, good. I there there are so many great hearty Greek vegetarian dishes out there um, to do something that you know to have those kinds of dishes and and whether you're using chickpeas or gigante beans or artichoke hearts, um, you know that, that are braised in in olive oil or slow cooked in tomato sauces. Um, or, or something along those lines that you either add cheese or don't, so you can make them vegan if you wish. There are so many dishes like that, and they'd be fantastic with this wine. I think what speaks to me about this wine is its flexibility, because it's not it's not too big, it's not too over the top. It's got good acidity, it's got good tag mm-hmm. grip. Mm-hmm. You know, it's subtle yet there's still body weight and, and heft at the same time. Like I said, it's like a fist in a velvet glove. I like it's interesting. That it's it's you know, it's interesting. It, it's different. It's different. Oh, it's definitely different. That's for sure. I mean, this is, you know, if you're, if you're used to drinking big, big jammy wines um, from certain parts of the world, this might be a little of a, 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 a game changer for you at Thank first, you. but in general, I think this stuff's absolutely delightful. Yeah, no, it is. So you where <laughs> I do, I like it, it but um, I'm, I'm, I'm having difficulty. I'm thinking of how would I describe the flavor the you know, what aromatics I'm getting out, out of yeah. it. I'm getting like, um, I'm getting like a, a, um, see, but I don't cook. So it's I a have a little thing. bit of, of, there's a, a little bit of an almond note in it. Right. Yeah. Like an almond paste. An yeah. Almond, yes. You know, paste. Yeah. Marzipan. That's Marzipan. it. Yes. yes. I get that. I get dusty red earth. There's a a wonderful sort of sweet herbaceousness to the wine. And that that right there is what is so intriguing to me is because typically herbaceous doesn't go with, in my brain, doesn't go with that little sweetness. And it's not a sweet wine. So people who are listening or watching, right? It's not a sweet wine. But but it typically, that sweetness doesn't go with a herbaceousness. So it's, it's, it's compelling. It's complex in that way. Yes. Yeah. Sharon says unripened strawberry in the taste. Yeah. Underripe strawberry. Yeah. White to red cherry. Yep. Cranberry. Cranberry. Um, that's what I was oops, mm. sorry. Cranberry is another one yeah. I would go with. Um but it's 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 do you wanna get a it's got a little bit of it's got a little bit of heat from the alcohol, which I actually right. think is almost pleasant in a in a strange way. Um but it's also got this there's this herbal component to the wine, both yeah. on the nose and on the palate, mm-hmm. that I, I find really delicious. With this this herbal note to it that really I lo- I love a lot. Can definitely it, can, drink, can definitely drink a few glasses of this. Yes, it so the the nose like is uh like an herbal tea nose to me. Mm-hmm. Okay, you yeah. know, they you know um like it like the good a night cranberry herbal. herbal tea. Yeah. Mm. yeah, 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 absolutely. So where do I kind of a two part question, where do you see the future of Castafali and where would you like to see the future of Castafali? Are they going in the same direction? I mean, I think, I think that you're going to see, fortunately, all right. So 90% of all Greek wine in Greece is made from indigenous Greek grapes. 10% is made from international grapes. And I think that's a great thing. I think that Greece should be working with their Greek grapes, mm-hmm. working with them exclusively. I agree. So I, I'm i hoping to see more Kotsafali on its own. And I think that you're going to see more Kotsafali on its own as more wineries get a hold of it and figure out what they want to do with it and what they can make with it by itself. Or if they are going to blend it, blend it with Greek grapes like Liatico and Mandalaria, which are red grapes. Um so, you know, that's 
that's where I'd like to see it grow. And I think it is going to grow in that direction. Now, in terms of it becoming this world beater, that's going to be, oh my gosh, they're going to be planting Kotsafali all over Greece and it's going to take over the world. <laughs> I don't think it's going to do that. I really don't. I think that it's got its own little funky corner in the world that people really are going to love, but I don't think this is ever going to be a wine that everybody is just going to be beating down the doors to get a hold of. Um, I mean, you know, Greece is one of the few countries in the world that produces more white wine than red wine. Most people go to Greece in the summertime, so they're drinking the white wines there. The white wines are so massively popular that Greek white wine, I think, is going to still be the dominant kind of figure in the Greek wine landscape. Um, but I think that Kotsufai is going to carve out a really interesting niche of itself for really delicious wines that go well with quirky cuisine and 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 and, and sort of quirky wine drinkers. <laughs> yeah, I can see it being very popular with the people who come in and say, I want to try something different. I want to try yes. something that yeah. I'm not seeing on every wine list that there is. I want, you know, a unique or what's special thing. to what's special to this area. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's, that's what, I mean, and that's where this wine, I mean, this wine has been on the wine list from the very beginning over at Crassi and it, you know, moves at a nice steady pace and a lot of wonderful people come in and have, say, I want to try something different. I want something medium bodied that's mm -hmm. off the beaten path. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, if you like to drink things like Nebbiolo, if you like to drink Pinot Noir, if you like to drink lighter Grenache, you're going to like to drink this. This is going to be yes. in your wheelhouse. You're going to find go this. With, I can go with that Nebbiolo. You yeah, because right. yeah, it's got the acidity. Right, exactly. It has the acidity for I mean, it. I think that people are really going to, you know, where I, where people are really going to fall in love with this. And I think that that's a good thing. I really do. Um, I, I'd like to see people, and this is, you know, this is going to get me in trouble, but I'd like to see a little less super big over the top full bodied red wine running around there out there. Yep. In the world. You know, the, you know, the huge 15% alcohol, 15, two, yep. 15, five, those really big wines are fun to drink. They are fun to drink. Let's not get it twisted, but I'd like to see some other styles of red wine, make some inroads back into the wine world. And this is definitely one of them that I'd love to see get a little bit more love. Definitely. I, I think I agree. There's a place for it. And yeah. 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 So we're coming up on, on our one hour, you know, time span. We don't want to, we try not to go too far over. Um, so Evan, where can people find you the restaurant and you do have a Greek wine club, I believe that you've, yeah, so that's all through the website. Yeah, that's all through. Yeah, that's. Tell us all about that. Yeah, no. So we have this wonderful wine club that we started. That's uh, you can get get through our website if you go to if you go to crusty, um, dot com or you know go to www.crusty.com. Um, you can find us there, um, and you there you can hit on the link to join the wine club. Now we only deliver locally in the Boston area because um, we can't ship out of state and that type of thing. Obviously, you know, wine shipping laws are always a little tricky. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm at Crusty more often than not. Um, I'm there a few days a week. And then I'm at Bar Vlaha, the new restaurant, a few days a week. I'm always just jumping around. But we've got a great, great staff of really well-educated wine professionals that can help you with any wine. If I don't happen to be there, if you happen to miss me somehow or another, there are so many servers we've trained so hard and done so much really good work um, to really learn Greek wine from top to bottom. So even if it's not me helping you, someone else is going to be able to help you in the, in the most wonderful way to find great wine. But I'm usually at Crusty more often than not poking around, selling wine to people, you know, spreading the and Greek. You have, and, and the website for Crusty is 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 www.crusty.com or crustyboston.com and are you do you have anything that is your own online that people can find you personally no i don't i don't have no. any of my own no, no. I don't, uh, I, 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 you're I'm, like my husband <laughs> smart i'm 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 just you know i i mean i have my my instagram or whatever but nothing really that 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 that, that special right now i'm just working hard with you know doing stuff with the blog on yeah. crusty.com and, and or crustyboston.com and uh you know just helping with the restaurant as much as i can now you can ship for your wine club you can ship just in massachusetts well the way that we have the wine club it just it we we deliver in the boston area 
Oh, right okay. now. That's what okay, so right it's Boston it's, City proper, like Sharon yeah. here who lives in Pembroke couldn't, couldn't get. I, I'm not sure. I believe Pembroke might be okay. I don't know. There's a certain radius. I know we'll ship out to Cambridge and some of the other areas around locally throughout, you know, but it's, it's, it, we just got it started. So we're literally coming up on our second month of existence. So far. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's, okay. it's very, very so new. It's a brand new baby, huh? It's a brand new baby. Absolutely. So we're still working on it. Absolutely. And before we let you go, if you have three, three things about Castafali that you would like people to, leave here with what would be three fun facts or important facts about Costa Fali? That it's beautiful with a wide range of food, that it is a great substitute for the normal, let's have Pinot Noir, let's have Nebbiolo, let's have Grenache choice for the night. And three, just to drink more Greek wine. And so if that's the bottle you pick up, to drink more Greek wine for the very first time, then do it. Just do it. Absolutely. Just do it. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. And it was great fun. I look forward to meeting you when I'm up yes. visiting my daughter. Yeah, please yeah. do. I will, I will, I'll be there. I'll I will sure definitely you email you and let you know. <laughs> yes, please do. Cheers. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Yamas. 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 <laughs> Have a great night. Thank you Yamas. so much. Have a great night. <laughs>